Good evening. It is time to begin service. Good to see each and every one of you in God's house tonight. Uh, welcome to those who are watching online. And expecting God to do a great and mighty work here tonight. Good to have Jimmy and Teresa and Landon with us tonight. All right. uh, good to have you uh, all the home folk out tonight. And we've got a lot to pray about uh, as we open up in prayer. Uh, first of all, I want to praise God for helping Brother Ball. He came through his surgery well on Monday, and he got to go home yesterday. So praise God. Just pray for him to have a quick recovery. Also, continue to pray for Sister Ball. Her, touch her, God will touch her knee. Pray for Sister uh, Taylor. Also, pray, continue to pray for Sister Granny. She's here tonight. Praise God. Uh, she's doing better. Uh, she had a fall and so got a little bruised up, but she's back here tonight. Praise God. Uh, let's continue to pray for uh, Robert Garen. Uh, pray for Sister Jane. Pray for Sister Angela and her family. Uh, pray for Sister Betty Garen. Uh, pray for Shauna that she'll get back in church. I uh, want to see her back. I want to see her get saved and get back in church serving the Lord. Continue to remember the Lambert family that's uh, still grieving. Also, to Tim Lucas' family, uh, that God will comfort them in their loss of their loved one. Uh, pray for Isaiah. He's supposed to have feeding tubes put in tomorrow. Pray for Joe and Brandy and Isaiah. Keep them in prayer. Also, Sister Granny asked to pray for Jerry Shelton. He's going to have to have radiation. Let's pray for him. You know, we've got a lot to pray about, but we've got a big God who... He's concerned about everything that concerns us. So if we'll, we'll stand and go to the Lord in prayer. Let's all pray. Let's pray for uh, Brother Marty Smith. He's a pastor friend of mine. His dad passed away this week, and uh, they've got a funeral tomorrow. Brother Tim Bean's going to preach it. Uh, so pray for his family. God bless yes. him and his whole family. Amen. Precious Heavenly Father, we just thank you and we praise you, Lord God. We give you praise, we give you honor and glory because you are God and you always will be God. You change God. Lord God, we know, Lord, your word, you said, must to bring our prayer request to you, Lord God, and have faith to believe, Lord God, that we can see what we can believe, Lord Lord, I thank you, God, praise you, Lord, preaching out the country, Lord God, all over. Take the wicked in their body, touch it, God, over.
You may be seated. Well, I'm going to speak a minute on this. What to do when you don't know what to do. Have you ever been to that place? I just don't know what to do. Well, I'm going to tell you what to do when you don't know what to do. Psalms 27, 14 says, Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. Isaiah 40 and 31. But they that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with their wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Wait upon the Lord. I mean, if you got him, you got everything. Praise God. This time we'll receive our tithe and offering. Get our ushers come. Brother Bubba and Brother Albright, can you help? Brother Albright, would you pray over this time of worship? God bless you for your faithfulness and giving. Uh, also, I forgot to mention, let's pray for Zach's grandpa that's got the uh, coronavirus. Yeah. Also, pray for Sister Tina and her family. They're going to be uh, coming back on Saturday, as I understand it. So pray for that God will give him a good, safe trip. This time, we'll have Sister Amy come and lead us in the congregation. Her, Sister Brady, and Sister Harris going to come and sing, and then we're going to join in with them. Get y'all to stand with us tonight. We're actually going to do this a choir song, Going Home. Y'all all know it uh, for the most part. So if you just join in with us on the chorus. Yeah, I'm going to sing the verses. <laughs> Our hope is in heaven, right? Our hope is in heaven. I'm ready for uh, my heavenly home. Let's sing about that tonight for just a little bit.
Have you ever went on a trip before and you time to go home, you want to get home so bad? You know, we haven't been to heaven yet, but we, we're homesick for heaven. That's where we want to be. I, I thank God we're going home. Praise God. This time I'll turn the service to our pastor, Brother Shelton. Let's give God a hand of praise tonight. Aren't you glad this old world's not our home? Thank God. I said, thank God. I was talking to a pastor friend of mine today, and he said, you know, I'm just, I'm just tired of all of this. It's happening. I'm ready for the Lord to come. How many feel that way tonight? Ready for the Lord to come again, rapture us out of this old world. This world, uh, I'm not that old, but I'm old enough to know a few things, and I know that I've never seen a time like what we're seeing right now. Never seen a time in my lifetime what's taking place around this world, and things are not getting better. They just seem to get progressively worse. But I'm glad the Bible said when you see all these things taking place to the church to look up, because your redemption draweth nigh. We preached on Sunday night about Jesus is coming quickly. That's what he said. The last words we have of Christ in the Bible, Revelations 22 and 20. He said, surely I come quickly. And he's going to come just any day now. A day like today, we're going to leave this old world. Amen. Amen. If that don't get you excited, your wood might be wet. Amen. Praise God. We're glad you're in the house of God tonight. We love you. It's good to have, uh, this is one of the nicest men I've ever met in my life. And I'd say it if he wasn't here. And it's got to be good stock because he's, he was, he's nephew, I believe, of Brother Terry Lucas. Is that right? Brother Lucas has gone on to be with the Lord, but this is his nephew, Jimmy. A lot of you know Brother, uh, remember Brother Terry out here, Sister Judy's husband, and uh, what a good man he was. And uh, I'm telling you, if I've ever known a man that could play some practical jokes on people, he was the best. I mean, practical jokers, you know, didn't have anything on him. He kept something going all the time. He was just a happy and funny man and preached his funeral, his home going out here at this church. And said it then a minute, I said, I'd walk around the world and back for that man. That's how much I thought of him and loved him. He was a good man. And so good to have Jimmy, his nephew, with us tonight. And uh, Jimmy put our ice machine in over there, and I got to meet him through the Albrights. They knew him and done some work for them. He's a good man. So good to have him and Teresa and Landon with us tonight. Give them a hand of appreciation. These are nice folks. Listen to me. Everybody in the world's not mean, and everybody in the world's not bad. Now, if you listen to the news long enough, you'll think that. You'll think everybody's gone crazy and everybody's bad. There's still some good people on this earth. And uh, these are good folks right here. And we're certainly glad to have them. I'm, you listen, you're good folks too. And we're glad to have you and those watching online. Everybody wave at them tonight. We've got some home folks that, uh, that won't come back yet that just want to be cautious and careful. But uh, they're on these services watching with us and got some other folks watching. And uh, we just hope that it's being a blessing to somebody and helping somebody. Aren't you glad to be saved? My grandfather used to always say the greatest testimony anybody can have is that I've been saved and that I am saved. We're saved by the grace of God through the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm glad for the blood. Amen. It washes away all sin. There's no sin, no bondage of sin that is greater than the power of the blood of the Lamb. The Lord of glory can cleanse and wash even the worst of sinners. Can you say amen? The Apostle Paul said, as Saul, he said, I was the chief among sinners. But just look at what the Lord done. And Paul described the condition of some of those people at Corinth, the condition they were in in sin. And he said, this is what you used to be. Such were some of you. But now you've been washed. You've been cleansed. Your life is different now. Can you shout amen tonight? Praise God. Give him a hand. It's all right. I appreciate my wife and girls. They did a good job tonight. I appreciate them. And I pray for Branson. He's not feeling well. And I pray God will touch him tonight. We've got some others sick. Let's pray for Brother Ball. Brother Ball had his hip replaced on Monday. Uh, everything went great. And uh, normally they keep people longer. Uh, but they had to get him out of there. 
They said, this is all we can take. So they sent him home the next day. <laughs> He's probably watching right now. I love him. Glad he got to go home. Had his surgery hip replaced on, on Monday. Went home on Tuesday. So let's pray God will help him to recover. He's going to do his rehabilitation there at home. And uh, let's just pray he'll be healed up and get back to church soon. Amen. If you have your Bibles, let's stand. Acts chapter 4 tonight. I want the Lord to help us for a little while. I know that he will. He's always faithful. We're going to verse 31 and reading Acts chapter 4. How many know we desperately need a revival? You listen to me. If something doesn't happen in our churches, nothing's going to change in the world. I said, if nothing happens in the churches, nothing's going to change in that world out there. We need a revival in our churches. Amen. Acts chapter 4, begin reading in verse 31. Let's pray. Father, we ask you right now, I stand here humbly tonight. Lord, as always, I need that divine touch, that touch from on high. I pray, God, that you'll just lay your hand on me for the next little while now. Lord, let it be easy preaching in the house of God tonight. Thank you for the good singing tonight, Lord, that's made the hearts ready for the word of God. Let that heart be fertile ground tonight. Break up any fallow ground this evening, Lord. Uh, we pray that we'll have a renewed desire for heavenly things. We'll have a hunger for revival. Lord, we'll meet the demands, what your word calls for. We'll align ourselves with your word that revival can be possible. Touch every man, woman, boy, and girl into the sound of our voice now. We thank you for loving us, God. We thank you for saving us, for keeping us, Lord. Uh, Thank you that we're not just saved by grace, but we're kept by the grace of God. Where sin abounds, uh, grace does much more abound. Would you save the lost, God? Would you restore the fall and the backslider? Sanctify, baptize with the Holy Ghost and fire. Heal the sick tonight, God. Uh, and Father, everything that's done, I pray that you'll get the glory. Hide us behind the cross tonight. God, set a guard upon my lips. Let me speak only heavenly things this evening. And we'll love you and praise you for it all. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said amen. All of God's people shouted amen. Bible says in Acts 4, begin reading in verse 31. And when they had prayed, look at what happens when we pray. And when they had prayed, the Bible said the place was shaken where they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. That sounds like the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. When the Bible said they were in one mind and one accord. And they were all baptized with the Holy Ghost and fire. Verse 32. And the multitude of them that believed were of one heart and of one soul. Neither said any of them that aught of the things which he possessed was his own. But they had all things common. Verse 33 says, and with great power. That is Holy Ghost power. That is the Spirit of God resting upon the church. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. May God add his blessings to his red word tonight. You can be seated for a little while this evening. Amen. I want to talk to you for a little while. I won't try to hold you a long time tonight. just want to preach to you what I feel like God's laid upon my heart. I want to talk to you on this thought as we've read here in verse 33, with great power, with great power. When we look at that early church, matter of fact, if you read from the book of Acts chapter 2 on through Acts chapter 28, and we see how God used that early church in a mighty way for his glory, we see how that they were marked with powerful preaching. They were marked with powerful miracles. 
the Bible said they experienced amazing growth and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, this was a powerful church that we read about in the book of Acts, that early church, the first church. The Bible said in verse 33, and with great power gave the apostles witness of the of this a, a resurrection of the Lord Jesus. Let me read it again. And with great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. When we look at that early church, when you read the exploits of that early church, uh, it doesn't take anybody long. I mean, if you're around the church today, from church to church, it doesn't take us long to realize that there was something different about that church than much of what calls itself the church today. Now, I realize that we possess much more than they did in some ways. We have a lot of things today that that early church didn't have. We have nice buildings to worship in. We have money in the banks. We have technology today. I mean, I can stand here and preach to this congregation tonight, uh, and all the while people are watching us live on Facebook and on YouTube, uh, and they can watch from all over the world this service taking place right here tonight. We have great technology today. We have a freedom to worship God. We can go to church freely. In this country, nobody, nobody threatens our life when it's time to go to church. Our lives are not threatened as we come in these doors out here. We can come to the house of God freely and we can worship God freely. Makes you wonder why people don't worship more in the house of God when we have such a freedom in this country to be able to worship Him. But this latter-day church lacks the one thing that made that early church a mighty weapon uh, in the hands of God. I believe that that one thing that we lack is that great power of God that they had. That early church went out into that world in that great power. And the Bible said that they turned the world upside down. Now, I don't know how you believe it tonight, but I believe according to the Bible uh, that we can have that same kind of power today uh, in the church. Matter of fact, I'll go a step further. I'll tell you that we must have that same kind of power uh, if we're going to make an impact in this world right here and right now. I'm not trying to be ugly here, and I'm not trying to be critical. I want to tell you it's going to take more than unity marches to make a change in this society. It's going to take more than Zoom conferences uh, for preachers and evangelists and pastors going to take more than a men's breakfast for the church uh, on a Saturday morning. going to take more than marching up and down the streets holding protest signs uh, to make an impact uh, in this society today. Uh, I'm telling you it's going to take the power of the Spirit of God uh, upon His church one more time uh, to make the church effective uh, and to promote change uh, in our society today. God never promised that kind of power just to the early church. That kind of power was never promised just for one generation or just for our forefathers. Peter stood up on the day of Pentecost and declared this truth in Acts 2 and 39. He said for the promise. When he says the promise here, he's referring to the Holy Ghost baptism. The power of the Holy Ghost uh, upon the church and in the church uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, for the promise is unto you, to your children, to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. According to the word of God, we can have this kind of power uh, and we can see the great exploits uh, of that early church uh, take place in this latter church. Now listen to me, if you don't believe that, uh, then I have to question uh, what, what is the use of having church? What is the point of being the church? 
The church has not just been called to gather in a building somewhere uh, and sing a little bit and preach a little bit and clap our hands and say amen uh, and go home. But the Bible tells us uh, that the Holy Ghost is given to the church uh, to make disciples uh, that we can go out and be a witness in this world uh, and be effective in the darkness of this world. Uh, the power of God is given to the church uh, so that we can go out in the darkness uh, and be a city set on a hillside uh, that cannot be hid, uh, we can be a great light in the darkness of this world today. Uh, if we don't believe that power is available, then we might as well turn the lights off in the church, uh, close the doors, and go home. Uh, but according to the Word of God, uh, we can have this power, and we must have this power. There's a lost and dying world uh, bound up in sin and the darkness of this day, uh, and the church has got to get on fire the church has got to come alive the church needs that power from on high to go out and to be the church in the world just one more time somebody shout amen tonight hallelujah to God I want you to notice with me here for a little while notice the source of that great power of the early church First of all, I believe the Bible shows us that that great power came from their purity. That early church was more than just a Pentecostal church. That early church was a holiness church. That early church was marked by her separation from this wicked world. When you saw that early church, you saw Jesus Christ in them. Matter of fact, the Bible said uh, that the communities of that day uh, took knowledge that they had been with Jesus. The purity that they walked in uh, produced the power they displayed. Uh, it produced the Holy Ghost power uh, in and upon that early church. Now you listen to me tonight. I believe that one of the greatest reasons that we're not seeing that power in this latter day church that the early church walked in is because of the lack of purity in this church age. Now, I don't even have to go to the Bible to prove this. I, I believe every one of you will agree with me uh, that the morals that we see today uh, are not like the morals when we were growing up. Uh, come on, say amen. I'm just telling you, turn your, turn your TV on. When I was growing up, you know, you had Andy Griffith show. The worst thing they did on the Andy Griffith show was light a cigarette up every once in a while. And even in that day, the churches protested against that uh, being on that show. Uh, the I Love Lucy show. I don't like Lucy show. Uh, my girls love the I Love Lucy show. Uh, but in that show, uh, when you watch them go into a bedroom to lay down, uh, they slept in separate beds. Uh, the church uh, made sure they did not lay in the same bed. But let me tell you something. Uh, fast forward to 2020. Uh, you can't even watch a commercial anymore uh, without two men holding hands and two women kissing uh, and people taking their clothes off. I'm telling and you uh, that this is a day uh, where morals are at a low ebb. Uh, I said the morals are very low uh, in this country and I'm afraid uh, that it's trickled over uh, into the church and it's trickled over uh, into the house of God uh, uh, among the church. Uh, one of the greatest reasons we don't see the power uh, in the church anymore uh, is because there's such a lack of purity in the house of God uh, among those who call themselves Christians today but I believe what the Bible says the Bible says let everyone that nameth the name of the Lord uh, depart from iniquity I believe the Bible said that we are to lay aside every weight uh, and the sin that does so easily beset us uh, and let us run this race with patience uh, that's been set before us. Uh, I'm just telling you we're a long way from the way that our forefathers lived I said we're a long way uh, from the way that our forefathers lived. Uh, and we're even farther away uh, from the way the early church lived. I've said it many times and I believe it's worthy of saying again. We have come a long way, uh, the wrong way in this modern day church. Amen. That early church uh, 
They were not occupied with their careers. They were not occupied with their money. They were not occupied with their hobbies, their prestige or popularity. They were not occupied with their sales. Matter of fact, they did not count their lives dear unto themselves. They did not cling to this old world. They did not identify with this old world. Amen. They knew that they were here, but they were just passing through. And they lived their lives as strangers and pilgrims in this land life you listen to me here tonight that early church had purity with the Lord they were a pure people they were a holy people they didn't mix with the ways of this world theirs was not a mixed religion but they were separate they walked a different road than the ways of this world amen while that world was walking the broad road that early church walked a straight and a narrow path amen they knew that they were in this world but they were not of this world they were a holiness people I said they were holy under God and they came out from among this world and they were separated under God and because of that purity they had power with God that they healed the sick and they raised the dead and they cast out devils and they preached under the anointing and lives were changed they had a holy boldness and all of this was because they were pure in their relationship with God they lived holy in this present evil world they were a holy people they were a separated people amen they had clean hands and they had a pure heart and they lived right and they had power with God Almighty. Many of our church people today would rather have the money. They'd rather have the careers. They'd rather have the hobbies. They'd rather have the popularity and the prestige. They'd rather live like and be like Hollywood than they would to live a holy life. They'd rather live to please themselves and because of their pursuit of these things. A lot of people in our church no longer live that pure and that holy life. They're satisfied with having the world, trying to have God too. Amen. Theirs is a mixed religion, but it will never work. I said it will never work. I'm telling you the church cannot mix with the world and expect they're going to have power with God Almighty. Somebody say amen to this preacher tonight. I'm just telling you if we're going to walk with God, we can't run with the world and we can't run with the devil. If we're going to have that kind of power with God, I believe Jesus said if any man's going to follow me, let him deny himself. Let him take up his cross and let him follow me every day. If we're going to walk with God and have the power of God and make a difference, then we've got to live a pure and a holy life. And we can by the grace of God. Somebody lift your hands and give him praise. It's impossible for the church to mix with the world. And live worldly and not be clean and pure before God and expect we're going to have power with Him. I want that kind of power from on high. How about you? I want to be a holy vessel. I want to be sanctified and made meat for the master's use. I want to be a vessel under honor to God. Amen. I want to match up with his word. Anybody feel that way? I want to make sure I've got clean hands and a pure heart. And that I'm walking in right relationship with the Lord of glory. And I believe when the church comes to that place, we can have that kind of power. Purity produces power. I said purity will produce power among the church. If you don't want it, don't worry, friend. You're not going to get it. But if you live holy, if you come out from among that world and be separated under God, God will clothe you in the power of the Holy Ghost and you'll make a difference in a time like this today. 
Somebody say amen. The church has got to go back to the altar. And the church has got to repent. And the church has got to get cleaned up again. The church has got to get cleaned up on the inside again. Oh, God, help my soul here. Got to get rid of all the bitterness in our heart. Got to get rid of all the unforgiveness in our heart. Come on, say amen. Got to get rid of all the gossiping in our hearts. I got to get rid of the jealousies and the lust that's down deep in that heart. We need God to cleanse us again in the church. The Bible said judgment's going to begin first right inside the house of the Lord. Now, I know what some people say. I know they say, well, God only cares what's in the heart. He don't care about the outside. But let me tell you something. That's not biblical. If God's going to get you, God's going to get all of you. God's going to get you inside uh, and outside and outside in. Uh, when God does a work on the heart uh, it's going to overflow into the outside. Uh, Somebody is going to see uh, that you've been with Jesus. Uh, your life is going to be transformed. Uh, and when the church comes back to that place uh, we're going to see that kind of power of God uh, rest upon the church uh, and we'll make a difference uh, one more time before the Lord comes again. Amen. We need God to get us on the inside. And we need God to cleanse us on the outside again. If God gets that heart, I believe what the Bible said. The Apostle Paul said in Romans 12 and 1, I beseech thee therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. I'm telling you, God does care how we dress. God does care how we look. God does care where we go. Come on, say amen to me. I'm telling you, you get the heart right, and the body's going to follow. I said get the heart right, and this skin tint is going to follow. We need a good old-fashioned cleansing again. We need the rivers to flow through the church and not be satisfied with just ankle deep or knee deep or loin deep. But the church needs to get in that cleansing river one more time and let God make her pure and holy and righteous so we can shine in the darkness of this world. Put your hands and praise Him tonight. Then God will fill us. I said, then God will fill us. Then God will use us for His glory. You tell me somehow. When I was coming up. I know there was worldliness trying to get in the churches. I'm not talking about sinners. We want every sinner to come in. We want homosexuals to come in. We want alcoholics and drug addicts to come in. Amen. We want the sinners to come in. I'm telling you sinners are going to live like sinners because they're lost. But the church, the people of God, we're not to live like sinners because we're no longer sinners. We've been saved. We've been brought out of darkness. We're in the marvelous light of the Son of God. I'm telling you the problem today is that much of this church has gotten worldly and much of this world has gotten churchy. Amen. There's no distinguishing marks much anymore between what it calls the church and the world. I want to tell you that the true church of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is not a denomination, but she is the church of the Lord. She'll be clean. She'll be pure. She'll be holy. And she'll be ready when the bridegroom comes again. Somebody say praise the Lord. That early church was a pure church. And so she produced great power. She was full of the Holy Ghost, full of the power of God. Not only was she a pure church, but their great power came from their prayer life. Well, you've helped me pretty good so far. It may get bumpy for a little while, so just buckle up and hang on. Hey, Amen. We'll get on through this. Not only were they pure, but they were a praying people. In our scriptures that I've read to you here this evening, the Bible tells us that when those disciples came back from their meeting with that Sanhedrin, the whole assembly came together in prayer. 
they began to seek the Lord. They began to call on God. And the Bible said in our verses of scriptures tonight uh, that as they're praying together in one mind and one accord, uh, the place was shaken and the Holy Ghost fell upon them uh, and refilled them with the presence uh, and the power of God. Now you listen to me. These are many of the same people uh, that we read about there in Acts chapter 2 uh, in that upper room on the day of Pentecost. Uh, they've already been filled with the Holy Ghost. Uh, they've already been baptized with the Holy Ghost. Uh, but now we find them in Acts chapter 4. Uh, we find them somewhere praying again. Uh, and while they're praying, uh, they're being refilled with the power uh, of the Holy Ghost. Uh, they've gathered together again. Uh, just like they did in the upper room on the day of Pentecost. God honored the prayers of those saints and when they prayed and they called on his name the power of God fell on them again just like it did at the beginning. Let me tell you something friend. I don't know how you feel about it but I'm tired of dead dry prayer services. I want to see the church come back together in one mind and one accord uh, and a lay hold of God uh, and we'll pray uh, until something happens. Uh, we'll pray till heaven comes down uh, and we're refilled again uh, and again uh, with the power of the Holy Ghost. Somebody say praise the Lord. Hallelujah to God. Here we are. Over 2,000 years later. And prayer is one of the least practiced disciplines in the church today. I said prayer is one of the least practiced disciplines in the church today. Now you have no problems getting folks to choir practice. You'll have no problems getting, getting folks to come to a bake sale. You have no problems getting folks come to a hot dog cookout uh, or a church meal at the local restaurant. You'll have no problem getting people coming out to a singing or to a Valentine's banquet. Sister Shelton, you probably better help me for the next little while because I, I got a feeling they ain't going to be too happy here just for a few minutes. But God's going to help us get on through with this and we're going to get it right and we're going to go on with God and going to have power with the Lord. Hey man, you don't have problem getting people, church people to come to those kind of things. But when you call a prayer night, I said when you call a prayer night of the entire church, uh, a time for them to come together uh, in one mind and one accord uh, and call on the name of the Lord. Uh, you listen to me. Uh, you'll be blessed uh, if you get a third of the people to show up. Uh, and I'm telling you, we're feeling the effects of it uh, in our churches today. Uh, we're lacking the power of God uh, because of it. Uh, I said we're lacking the power of God uh, because of a lack of prayer uh, and a failure to pray uh, among the church uh, in this hour. I believe that a Monday night prayer service should not be looked at any different uh, than a Sunday service. Now, you put your heads at me. I said a Monday night prayer servant, uh, service should not be considered any less of a service uh, than a Sunday service. Uh, we ought to be faithful to it. Uh, we ought to be a part of it. Come on, say man. Uh, just like every other service uh, during the week. Somehow, somehow it's got into the church uh, that the prayer service is less of a service uh, than the Sunday morning service. And prayer service is not as important uh, as a Sunday night service or a Wednesday night service. But let me tell you something. Uh, every service uh, is important to the child of God. Uh, whether it's a Sunday school service uh, or Sunday morning worship uh, or Sunday night service uh, or Wednesday night service uh, or a Monday night prayer meeting. Uh, every service is important uh, to the child of God. Uh, and we ought to do our best to be there if all possible and to be a part of it and I believe when we get to praying again we're going to see that power of the Holy Ghost fill the house and fill the saints of God one more time hallelujah to God I got to move on here prayer 
is one of the least practiced disciplines among the church. I'm not trying to be ugly or rude here. You know how I love you. I don't believe any of us won't take this microphone and tell how much time we've spent talking to God today. I said, I don't believe any of us won't take this microphone and get up here and tell how long we've spent talking to God this week. The average church person prays not much more than two minutes per day average. We spend an average in the United States of America. The average person spends more than five hours a day in front of the television. The average Christian spends more, no more than two minutes per day praying. And you wonder why we don't have any power with God. I didn't come to be mean or be ugly or beat you up. Just come to preach my heart as a shepherd tonight. I'm just telling you during the COVID-19 pandemic, we couldn't meet out here on Monday nights for the prayer service. So we were not able to. Uh, so we started a call in prayer service. You know why we did that? We, we could have very simply said, you know what? We're just not going to have, we're, no, we're just not going to have prayer, prayer service right now. I'm not going to have prayer meetings right now. I'll, I'll just be honest with you. You know, we could have even said we're not going to have church right now. Some pastors just called services off. We didn't. We had them in the parking lot in the heat. We put in a system here so you could watch it online if you couldn't be in the house of God, doing everything we can to try to minister to people and keep people serving God and keep people, you know, going forward with God. So because we couldn't meet on a Monday night in our prayer services, we started a call-in prayer service. But we did this so that the church could still join together in prayer and we could seek God together. We did this so that the ones who couldn't come to the outdoor services, at least they could still stay connected to the brothers and sisters of the church and have a time of prayer with one another. Oh, I'm going to say something ugly, but I don't mean it ugly. I told Sister Shelton, some of the very ones we did that prayer service uh, for that couldn't be here uh, in, the, in the outdoor services. I, I said, you know, a lot of them never even called in one time. Say, man, Sister Shelton, I'm going to move right on here. We did that to help people. We did the prayer service, the call-in service, uh, amen, so that we could keep the church on our knees uh, and we could keep the church close to the Lord. I didn't come to be mean or ugly. didn't come to beat you up. I'm telling you, I watched that thing Monday night after Monday night after Monday night. And every prayer service that we had, we only had about 25 or 30 percent of this local congregation. Now, I can't testify to other congregations. I don't pastor other churches, but I do pastor this church. We only had about 25 to 30 percent participation to call in from a, for a time of prayer. And this is the sad thing about it. Nobody had to leave their house. Nobody had to get in their car and drive over to the church. Didn't have to go out in the heat. Just all you had to do is pick up the phone, call in, and we had prayer together. The same ones that showed up for prayer night. When we were able to have it in the church, they're the very same ones who called in for the prayer service on the phone. I told Sister Shelton this. I hope you don't get mad at me. If you do, I'll go home and eat dinner with you, and we'll be all right. If we cannot get the church to pray during a pandemic like this, then God help the church. I said if we cannot get the church to a prayer meeting, to a prayer service, and call it on God, then we're a long way from revival. I, I said we're a long way from revival. I, then a raven he'll say it. If we're not praying, I, then we're playing. I'm just telling the church, I, if we want that power, I, if we want that unction, I, if we want that strength, I, we've got to get back in the prayer closet. I, we've got to get back on our knees. I, and we've got to learn how to pray one more time. Hallelujah to God. I know some of you don't like that. I'm not preaching to be ugly. I'm preaching from my heart here. We only have 25 or 30 percent participation on a prayer night. And this was every Monday night. This went on for, for two or three months every Monday night. And we couldn't get no more than 30 percent to call in. I'm telling you, we're a long way from revival. 
We say we want it, but I'm going to tell you, it's going to cost us time in prayer. It's going to cost us time on our knees. I, I know there's some folks not here, but there's some folks in church. They're satisfied. We, we just, you know, just hanging around the fringes, hanging around the edges of this thing. But if we're going to have revival, if we're going to see our lost family members saved, if we're going to reach this community, we can't be dead and dry. But we got to get on fire. And our lamps have got to be trimmed and burning. And when the church prays, heaven will come down. God will hear our prayers. God will answer. And God will move among the church by the Spirit of God. Amen. We're well taught in our theology, our doctrine, in our organization. But many people are illiterate in the school of prayer simply because we've either lost our desire to pray or we simply we've just forgotten how important prayer is in the life of the church, in the life of the individual believer. How much time do you spend in prayer per day? I said, how much time do you spend in prayer per day? You spend more time on that television, in front of that television, than you do talking to God. Friend, you're not going to have that kind of power I'm preaching about here tonight. It's going to be hard to be an example to your families. It's amazing to me. God help me not to be ugly here, smart alecky. It's amazing to me. Sometimes we spend more time in prayer requests asking for prayer for our families than we actually do praying for our lost families. It's always easier to ask somebody else to pray for them. I said it's always easier to ask the preacher to pray for them or somebody else in the church. But I'm telling you, friend, if we're going to have that power, like the early church, we've got to be praying people. I said we've got to be people of prayer. I'm getting ready to close in Luke. Some of you, are, some of you look like you're ready for me to quit. I, I'm almost through here. In Luke 11, the disciples came to Jesus. And this is what they asked him. They said, Lord, teach us how to pray. They had witnessed his miracles. They watched him raise the dead. They watched him cast out demons. They watched him heal the sick. But they never one time asked him to teach them how to heal the sick. They never asked him how to, how to raise the dead or how to cast out devils or how to perform miracles. You know why? Because they recognize that his source of power, it came from his prayer life. The Bible said again and again how he, 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 he drew away in a secret place and there he would pray all night to the Father. Prayer was his habit of his life. He was disciplined in talking to the Father and those disciples recognized that that's where his power to perform the miracles it came from his life of prayer and from that prayer came the power of God upon the Son of God. They knew if they could pray like he prayed, then they would have that same kind of great power to cast out devils and to heal the sick and to raise the dead. They would have that same kind of power to be effective in their ministry on this earth. A.W. Tozer said prior to Pentecost, the disciples said, Lord, teach us to pray. He said, you never find that question in the book of Acts and afterward." Prayer was an automatic exercise for those in the early church. Nothing delighted them more than gathering together for prayer. They were praying people, and not only that, God was working through their prayer. He went on to say, if we are to have revival today, and I pray for that sincerely, I believe it will begin in this area, prayer. Once today's Christians have gotten beyond the silliness of amateur prayer and begin to take it as seriously as those early Christians, things will begin to happen as they did back in those old days. Sister, come on, get ready to play. I'm telling you, in this Latter-day Church, what we need desperately in this hour is a hunger again. For a prayer time, an altar, and that the church will build that old-fashioned order again, and we'll begin.
begin to call on King Jesus and we'll begin to spend time alone with him and we'll join together corporately and we'll seek God together in one mind and one accord I'm telling you we can see the same great exploits we can see that same great power rest upon the church again today listen to me friend it's going to cost us something it's going to cost time in prayer and fasting it's going to cost time in turning everything else off and getting alone with God but if we'll do that we'll walk in that power we'll have that anointing and amen we'll go out and be able to turn this world upside down one more time a prayerless life is a powerless life I said a prayerless life is a powerless life we must be a holy and a pure people got to come out of Egypt and got to get Egypt out of us and off of us we must be a pure and a holy people. And we must be a praying people. If we're going to operate in that great power that the early church had. God used them and God blessed them. And he worked through them in demonstration of divine power. The Bible said there they were together, gathered together. The place was shaken where they were assembled. They were praying, they were seeking God. Their hearts were right with God. And the place was shaken and they were all filled and refilled with the Holy Ghost and the power of the Lord. A.W. Tozer said, it pains me deeply to see the evangelical church in such a state knowing the remedy is only a prayer away. He said, the true success of any church is going to be prayer. We can easily deceive ourselves, but our purity and power and our spirituality and holiness will parallel our prayer. We can't be any more pure than our prayer life is. If we're not praying like we should, we're not going to be pure like we should. Nod your head and say amen to me. So my challenge tonight to the church is let's get back to praying again. Let's become a people of prayer again. A people that know how to lay hold of God. A people that know how to turn everything else off in this world and get alone or get away with God and call on God and seek God and see what God will do. If we don't become a praying people again, we're not going to walk in the purity that will produce the kind of power that the church must walk in to make an impact today. March all you want. Do all the unity marches you want. Do all the protests you want to do. Have all the conferences you want to have. But if we don't come back to a place of prayer and pray through until we're pure before God, we're not going to have any power to change anything in this world. Let me ask you this. What has all of this outside that's happened so far, what's changed? Has anything changed? We've had unity marches. We've had, you know, we're standing at the courthouse and doing all those things. We, we're carrying signs. We're protesting. What's changed? Is the racism gone? Is there unity among people anymore? Has anything changed? Look out that world. Things are getting worse. They haven't changed for the better. And until the church comes back and becomes the church, nothing's going to change outside the walls of the church. So my suggestion to every church, including this one, is let's forget about all the rallies and all those things right now. Why don't we build an altar again? And why don't we stay there until God convicts us uh, and God moves upon our hearts uh, and finally once and for all uh, we come back separated from that old sinful world. Uh, we ain't never going to reach that world living like that world. I said we'll never reach that world uh, living like that world, looking like that world, acting like that world. Uh, but when God can work in us and we'll pray through uh, till he cleanses our hearts and makes us pure, uh, I'm telling you then uh, we can be a true light in this 
this world, uh, then we can make a difference in that community. And until that happens, uh, we're just going to go round and round and round. Uh, and nothing's ever going to change. Well, don't shout me down because I'm preaching so good tonight. Nothing's going to change. You say, we are praising. We are praying. Well, we're not praying through till God convicts us about some things. Some worldly mess in our churches that we're letting go on, that pastors are letting go on. I believe you get them people praying sincerely and will touch God. God will touch some places in the church again that he's not pleased with. And listen, he'll blow through that church. He'll, he'll blow that mess out of there. And that church will identify with a holy God rather than a hellish Hollywood again. And we'll be a light. We'll be clean. We'll be pure. And the people of this world are going to know that we've been with Jesus Christ. Stand with me, please. We got to get back to praying again. And ask the Lord to cleanse our hearts. Make us pure. Make us holy. Forgive us of our sins. Forgive us of our worldly attitudes. Forgive us of our worldly appearance. Forgive us of our worldly appetites. Forgive us of our worldly actions. Cleanse us, God. Make us pure. Make us holy. Make us like that early church one more time. Lift your hands and ask Him, God, help us tonight. If the church doesn't get back to praying, she's not going to get back to pure living. She's not going to get back to holy living. And until that happens, we're not going to make it. We're not going to have any effect in this world. I didn't come to be mean or beat you up tonight. You know my heart. I love every one of you. This is a good holiness church. We've got a good standard here. I'm telling you, we're lacking in the prayer. I said we're lacking in prayer. We're a long way from having the kind of revival God wants us to have here at South Asheboro. We can't get a, but a third of participation for a prayer service. We're a long way from revival. We're a long way from what God wants to do through us. I can't preach about other churches, but I know this church. This is a great church. But we need God to pour out His Spirit upon us again. To cleanse us and purge us and make us what He wants us to be. So that we can make an impact in those in the darkness those that are bound by sin every head bowed and every eye closed please let's pray Father thank you thank you for helping me tonight God I can't do anything without you I need your help Lord not just every time I preach but I need your help each and every day I pray you'll help our churches God we want to see revival Lord but how can we have revival when we're not praying like we ought to pray? Lord, teach us to pray again. Lord, teach us how to pray again. Teach us to pray like you prayed, Jesus. Renew that desire in us again for prayer. Renew that hunger again in us for prayer, God. I believe when we get to praying like we ought to, I believe you're going to you're going to deal with some areas in the life of the church that's not pleasing to you. God, help us to get those things under the blood and, and make us pure and holy and clean and righteous, Lord. Fill us with the power of God. Let us go out with great power, Lord. Let us be a light to our lost family members, this lost community, those lost around us on the job those we come in contact with in Walmart and places around this world, God. Let us go forth with that kind of great power that that early church walked in and that early church operated under. Forgive us of our prayerlessness. Forgive us for our lack of purity, God. Only you can help us, Lord. Only you can change us, God. 
I pray you'll touch every life here tonight, Lord. I pray if there's a lost soul, you'd save them tonight. I pray you'd convict them, Lord. I pray you'd let them know that in the condition they're in, they're going to die and go to hell. But I pray, dear Lord, before they leave, you'd let them know that through your blood and through your mercy and grace, they can be saved. They can be changed. They can have their names written in the Lamb's book of life. They can leave here on their way to heaven, God. I pray for those watching online tonight, Lord. I pray this message has convicted each heart. I pray it's touched their heart the way it's touched mine, God. Oh, that we'll be drawn ever closer to you, Lord. We want to draw nigh to you. And you said if we'll draw nigh to you, then you will in return draw nigh to us. Oh, God, forgive us of our worldly attitudes. Forgive us of our worldly appearance today, Lord. Forgive us of our worldly appetites and our worldly actions. And forgive us, dear Lord, for believing that we can mix and be a mixture with that world and, and be like that world and still have walked with you and still have the power of God to rest upon us. Do that sanctifying work in us, Lord. Make us holy, God. Woo! Make us pure, Lord. Empty us of all that is not of you. And then fill us with all that you are, God. Fill us with the power of God. God, let it start right here in this church. Let it start right here in this community, God. We pray for revival to come. We pray for revival to come to churches around this world, oh God. Help us to realize all the marching in the world is not going to change anything. If we're not dressed up in that power of God, help us to realize that the only way to be dressed up in that power of God is we've got to come out from among that world and no longer be mixed with that world, God. That worldly system and the sins of this world Cleanse the church. Purge the church, God. Make her holy again, God. Fill her with the power of the Lord. How many want that power? Raise your hands to Him. I don't want to be dead. I don't want to be dry. I don't want to be lifeless. But I believe the church, the plan for the church, is to be alive and on fire, full of the Lord. I'm going to tell you something, friend. When you see the church, people of the church, people of God out in that world, people are going to recognize that you've been with the Lord. I said they're going to take notice that you've been with the Lord. I've been places and didn't have my suit on. I had clothes on, but I wasn't wearing a suit. And I've had people tell me, you're a Christian, aren't you? I didn't have no... I didn't have a Jesus shirt on or a ball cap, had a fish on it. I had clothes on. But I wasn't dressed like a preacher. And I've had people say, you're a preacher. And I always say, how can you tell? How can you tell? I don't know if there's just something about you. You've had people do the same thing to you. You're a Christian. I can tell you're a Christian. When you've been with the Lord, friend, and you, you come out from that world, and you're not, you're not a, a mixture. I'm telling you, you stand out in this world. People are going to see Christ in your life. How are they going to see him in your heart unless he shows up on the outside of you? I said, how are they going to know he's in your heart unless he shows up on the outside of you? How you walk, how you talk, how you dress, how you live, where you go, what you refuse to do. We need standards again in the church. Biblical standards again. In the church, this is a free-for-all today, Brother Benny. Anything goes anymore. You can live any way you want to. As long as you say you're a Christian, that makes you a Christian. But that's not biblical. The Bible said in 2 Corinthians 5 and 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things are passed away. The old life's passed away. Old things become new. He changes us. We need. That great power again. Can you give him a hand of praise? You can be seated just for a moment. I know this wasn't a cotton candy message. I don't even know how to preach a cotton candy message. 
But I hope this message has challenged this church and convicted us and caused us to recognize if we're going to do it, it's not going to be by might nor by power. Our might, our power, our strength, our ability, our intellect. It's going to be by my spirit, saith the Lord. Amen. If we're going to have his spirit rest upon us, we've got to be a praying people and we've got to be a pure people. Can you say amen? amen. Come back Sunday. Service will be at 11 o'clock. Again, we're going to keep that for the time being 11. No Sunday school. Uh, we will be uh, ushering you in, ushering you out. And uh, pray for Sister Tina and their family. They're coming back, I believe, the weekend. I believe that's right. Pray God will give them traveling grace uh, as they come home. And uh, pray for Brother Marty Smith. Again, he's a good pastor friend of mine, good man, man of God, good wholeness preacher. And I got a great church. And his father passed away. Let's pray God will help them tomorrow at that funeral and comfort them. Pray for uh, the Tim Lucas family. God will help that family right now. I know they're in shock. They're, they're hurting. They're surprised that, you know, the Bible says we're here today and we're gone tomorrow. We don't know. Our life's like a vapor. We don't know we're going to leave this life. One moment we're here, the next moment we can be in eternity. That's why it pays to make sure we're walking with God all the time like we're supposed to be. Pray for that family. God will help them and touch them. And uh, don't forget about revival coming up, Brother Jimmy Jones. That'll start on uh, July the 5th on a Sunday morning. That'll go through Wednesday night the 8th. Uh, we'll let you know about the service time that morning. We're not sure about Sunday school yet. We're just going to play it by ear and just kind of use some wisdom here. But as of right now, our, our service on Sunday, all of them are at 11 o'clock and then 6 that night. Uh, revival will be Sunday morning through Wednesday night. Let's be praying for this, asking God to help us and to move and help Brother Jimmy. Uh, looking forward to having him. And I, I believe in God's going to do great things. Amen? All right. God bless you for coming. We're so glad to have, again, Jimmy and Teresa and Landon. Give them a hand again. Appreciate them. Thank you all for coming. Hope something said or done. You want to come back and be with us again. All of you, let's work. Let's invite people. Let's tell them the Lord's coming. Let's get on fire and let's be a light in this world. Amen. Brother Charlie, you want to help escort them out? Scott, you want to help turn on this side? Just stay where you are. He's going to come and get you. And uh, God bless you. Have a wonderful week. Every one of you, we love and appreciate you. If you need something, call us, okay? There is a blood that cost a life that paid my way death its price when it flowed down from the cross my sins were gone my sins for God there is a grave that tried to hide this precious blood that gave me life but in three days he breathed again and rose to stand in my defense oh, Free the bow as the 
a grave and it tried to hide this precious blood that gave me life There is 